Amen. I'd like for you to take a Bible, if you would, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And then Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, God laid that verse on my heart just a little while ago during the prayer. And when you get to Luke chapter 2, we're going to stand in honor and reverence to the Word of God this morning. The Word of God, Jesus, is in our presence this morning. Open that Bible up and you'll see him, okay? So when you get there, would you please stand? Luke chapter 2. Let's do this and read this together. And uh, we're going to read verse 1 through verse 19. So as you read this, just let it, just let it go into your heart as it comes out of your lips. And uh, let's lift our voices. There's no better way to do that than just by giving God His Word. Amen. So let's read this out loud together, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people." For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe, lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. Now in Hebrews chapter 10. I'll give you just a minute or two to turn there. Hebrews chapter 10. I love this passage. Here we have recorded for us the very words that Jesus spoke before he left heaven to be born in the manger of Bethlehem. This is the... and. The writer of Hebrews, how he got it was by inspiration of God. God told him these words. He says that, let's read it uh, together in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 10. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we stand in agreement this morning. We stand in reverence both to you and to this word that you have given us. We believe and trust you, God, and we believe your word in what it says. We believe that our Savior was born as a baby in Bethlehem and born of a virgin. We believe that Joseph was not his father because his father was God, the mighty God. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us a heart 
that at this time, this time of year, believes what you said and knows what season this is and knows, Father, what this time is all about. Rather than those in our own country who have lost the notion of what Christmas is or what the birth of Christ is all about. They celebrate it with alcohol. They celebrate it with, with football games. They celebrate it with drunkenness. They celebrate it with fornication. And they regard not the words that were given to us in this land. Our forefathers knew what this day was all about. And they gave honor to you. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would lay it upon the heart of your people all over the world to make known abroad what the angels told, what the shepherds saw, what Mary did, what the wise men gave. Let it be known abroad by your people all over the world that we come to honor not Santa Claus, not anything else, but we come to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless this message. Lord, you laid it on my heart. I thank you, Lord, for showing me some things I'd never really thought of before. And Lord, it blessed my heart. And Father, I pray for those, Lord, whose heart have become so hardened by legalism and Phariseeism, Lord, that they've had the joy and the beauty and the wonder of this time of year taken away from them. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would just put it in our hearts, dear God, to celebrate you and to thank you for what you've done for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I did some thinking last night, and uh, it actually took me longer to go through this. And I'm going to read some things to you because they won't be, you won't be able to see them up on the screen. But I'm going, to, I'm going to read to you this morning some things that God laid on my heart about why... Oh, you may be seated. Sorry. Some of y'all are just so good, you know. I posted some things last night that I didn't, I didn't read the comments. I heard about them. And uh, I have dealt with this issue every year. And I've been kind and courteous to people who, there are some who feel like maybe God is telling them not to have any kind of recognition of December 25th and the birth of Christ and so on. I don't want to defile anybody's conscience. If God really said that to them, I agree with what Paul said when he talked about how God, how some regard a certain day and there are some who regard all the days. And he said, to the one who regards a certain day, to the Lord he regards that day. To those who regardeth all the days, to the Lord they regard all of those days. And so I don't want to take that away from somebody if, God has genuinely laid that on your heart. But then the accusations begin to fly to those who, by tradition, this time of year, we celebrate and honor the birth of Jesus Christ in this world. Now, it quit being about Santa Claus a long time ago for me. It quit being about what I was going to get for Christmas or what I was going to give somebody. I mean, I'm not, I haven't turned down any of the presents yet. Okay? But if I don't get anything, I'm old enough to where I don't cry anymore when I don't get something. Okay? So I can handle that. It's not about that for me. What it's about for me is the significance of this particular time. Now, we know that Christ was not born on December 25th, year one. Okay? When Christ was born, we do not know. 
The Bible does not tell us. So you know what that means? If you, hear me out, kids. If you want to have a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ in June, you can do it. Did you hear that, kids? So maybe you can talk mom and daddy into having it twice a year. And you would ju be just as right in doing that in June as you would be in December 25th. Because the Bible doesn't tell us what day Jesus was born. And some use that to say, see there, since we don't know, we can't do it. And I'm here to tell you, I went through the Bible last night, and I was just awestruck at the significance of how much of the Bible speaks of this one day. The day that Jesus was born. Let me run down kind of what I'm talking about. In Genesis, the very creation of the, la of the first man, Adam, speaks of Christ's birth as he is called. Adam was called the Son of God. That's in Luke chapter 3, verse 38. The day that Adam was born, God counted him as a Son of God. And his birth, or his creation, is a foreshadowing of Christ's birth. The very first prophecy in the Bible, in Genesis 3.15, was about the birth of Jesus Christ. When it said, the seed of the woman shall bruise this, the head of the seed of the serpent. The second human born on this earth, Abel, is a foreshadow of Christ's birth. And you'll find that in Genesis 4. If you'll see Abel as a type of Christ, you'll see that he was slain by the wicked one. Just like Jesus was. Um, Christ's birth was the seed mentioned in Genesis chapter 12, the seed of Abraham, by which all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's what God told Abraham. He said, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And he was referring to the birth of Jesus Christ. The birth of Isaac as a child of promise speaks of Christ's birth. So also does the birth of Jacob. Remember, Esau was born before Jacob, and yet Jacob was the one chosen. The birth of Jacob as the one who receives the inheritance. Christ's birth is seen in Joseph, who is his father's beloved son. His birth prophesied by Moses' birth as both Pharaoh and Herod tried to kill both Moses and Jesus. His birth spoken of in the law of the firstborn son belonging to the Lord. You'll find that in Numbers chapter 18, verse 15. The birth of Samson foreshadows Christ's birth, whose parents were foretold by the angel of the Lord. That's in Judges chapter 13. That's exactly what happened with Jesus. Are you catching where I'm going with this? As in Samuel's birth, Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, who was given to Hannah, who gave him back to the Lord, so Christ was given to us, and then he returned to God. Christ's actual birth was prophesied in Genesis 49.10, when it said, Shai, called him Shiloh. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, the Bible calls him a star with a capital S. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2. Isaiah 7, 14. For unto us a child is born. Uh, Isaiah 9, 6. For a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Isaiah 11, for one. He is the seed of Jesse, the stem, the stem or the, of the rod of David. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Gives the exact location that Christ was to be born. That's where Herod asked the, asked the scribes. They said, where is he born that is to be king of the Jews? They went through the Bible and they said that's in Micah chapter 5 that his the one who was going to be born in Bethlehem whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting this verse here Hebrews chapter 10 popped into my head while we was praying a while ago he's actually quoting from the book of Psalms and and it was recorded what Jesus said right before he left heaven to come to be born of Mary he said lo I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. You see, the whole Bible, if you start thinking about it, speaks of 
and gives honor and reverence to this one day. That is the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's see here. Precise details of his birth are given to us in two of the four gospel accounts. The book of Matthew and the book of Luke give us the precise details of his birth. His birth was celebrated by John the Baptist who leaped in the womb of Elizabeth when she found out that Mary had conceived and was going to bring forth a child. So, all y'all that want to call us pagans for celebrating the birth of child, get in line. And, John, and if you're going to start accusing us, start with John the Baptist first. I'm not done. His birth was celebrated by a multitude of angels who sang songs in his honor. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. His birth was celebrated by the shepherds, first by their adoration of baby Jesus, then by making known abroad and praising God for the birth of their Savior. His birth was celebrated by Simeon, who was promised that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And when he took, the Bible said Simeon ran when Mary brought him to the temple, grabbed baby Jesus into his arms, and he said, Let thy servant now depart in peace, for I've seen thy salvation. He's the light of the Gentiles and the glory of his people, Israel. He said, God, he said I can die now. His birth was also celebrated by Anna, the prophetess, on the same day as Simeon, who gave thanks and spoke of him throughout all Jerusalem. His birth, recognized in the preaching of Peter and John, who spoke of the holy child Jesus in Acts chapter 4, verse 27 through 30. They did not call him the grown man Jesus. They referred to the holy child Jesus. Twice they did that. His birth spoken of by Paul in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, saying, when the fullness of the time was come. Ladies, you know about the fullness of the time, don't you? When the water breaks and you say, honey, the fullness of time has come. Not quite like that. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. That speaks of Christ's birth. Spoken of also by John in 1 John 4, 9, showing us that Christ's birth manifested the love of God. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world. By the way, that, if I, if I remember right, is... No, I was thinking Psalm 2, but in one of the Psalms, it says... Oh yeah, here it is. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The, it was prophesied in the scriptures of a certain day that Christ was going to be born here on this earth. His birth, seen by John in the Spirit, who reveals to us the woman who gives birth to the man-child who is to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And that's from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. There's only one creature that I know of for certain that hates the birth of God's Son. And that's the dragon in Revelation 12 who stands before the woman so that when she gives birth, he can devour that child as soon as it's born. The devil hates the birth of God's only begotten son here on this earth. I will not be found in the league of Satan. And I will not be accused of being in league with the devil. Because I choose. You see, there is no commandment in the Bible that we have to get together on any day whatsoever and honor and commemorate the coming and the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is no commandment in this Bible. You know what that means? You're not here by force. You're here by choice. 
That means we're free. And if Christ has made you free, you are free indeed. There's just some people out there that don't understand liberty. They don't understand the gospel of our salvation because they make the gospel about what they either do or don't do. And they love to boast about it. All you have to do, if you don't believe me, all you have to do is get on Facebook at this time of year and you're going to find the people who come out thrashing and slashing and name-calling those who by choice give honor to the Lord Jesus Christ at this time of year because they boast that they don't do this. That's because they believe down in their heart that they are saved by what they did or did not do. And I've never been saved by what I did or didn't do. And I'm still not saved by what I do or don't do. I'm not saved because we're having a joyful celebration about Christ's birth. I'm not saved because of that. I'm saved because Christ was born. That's why I'm saved. Amen. Amen. Now, go back to Luke chapter 2. A lot of th- I've preached a lot of messages at Christmas. It is, by tradition, we call it Christmas, even though we're not Roman Catholics, we don't celebrate His Mass. We don't do that. Uh, we don't believe that Jesus shows up and becomes a piece of bread that you eat. Okay? We don't believe that. But by tradition, it's called Christmas. You can call it the birth of Christ. You, you can call it Feliz Navidad, which references the birth. That's Spanish, by the way. I speak Spanish. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> Prospero año y felicidad. See, I speak Spanish. And um, so, I mean, I don't know what else to call it other than what we've called it all along. But here's something I think of every time this year. And this, I, I don't know, I, I've got it in my notes, and it didn't show up here. I think, I think it got cut off on the bottom. Do you know those wise men that came? They came to Bethlehem. It wasn't quite on the very night that Jesus was born, because Mary and Joseph had already found a place to live there in Bethlehem, but they weren't in Bethlehem very long. But these three wise men came, and they followed a star. Now... The Greek word wise men there is the word magi. And I know what that means. These wise men were not Christian men. They were not God-fearing, King James Bible-believing, born-again Christians. They were pagans. And yet, God showed them the light. And by their wisdom, they decided to follow that star. And that star, that was not... Jupiter, that was not, you know, Sirius the dog star or Orion, that was not anything like that. That was an angel that guided them to the very house that Jesus was in. And they went into that house and they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And did you know that Isaiah prophesied, Isaiah prophesied, that kings would come and adore him and offer him gifts of gold and frankincense. It named them by name. And God favored those men so much that he knew that Herod was waiting for them to come back and he would have killed them. And so they were told by God to go back a different direction. See, God saved those men. Even though they were pagans and astrologers, and divination people, and yet God saved them. You see, because we can make Christmas, people make Christmas in whatever they want to, and it it does, it bothers me when I go to the stores, and the first thing that these big stores now want to sell you is a bottle of vodka for Christmas. That eats me up. 
Because Christmas is not about how drunk you get. Christmas is not about how much... Uh, there's an Aldi's commercial on where this mom, she's got her little brat kids running all through the house and she's got a bottle of white wine that she bought from Aldi's. She said, looks like it's going to be a white Christmas. First of all, she ought to whip her kids. They wouldn't run around like that, amen? She wouldn't need that. That stuff bothers me. Because you don't add drunkenness to your sin to celebrate Jesus. And to them, it's about the best present, the biggest TV on Black Friday, or getting an iPhone 20, or about putting in the most food, or watching the most football games, or whatever. It's not about that. Now, I'm not saying watching a football game is evil. I'm not saying having family get together is wrong. I'm not saying that giving nice gifts to people is something wrong with that. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying that they ought to keep the Lord first in His day. If you're going to celebrate what we know to believe, the celebration of Christ's birth in this world, then leave the whiskey and the vodka and the Santa Claus out of it and honor the Lord first, and He'll give you everything else after that. You see, here's what it really is about. It's not about all that. It's about... Christ, and this is how the angels introduced him. He said in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And I want you to ask yourself this morning, do I need a Savior? Can I tell you, can I tell you what your Bible says about the Virgin Mary? To the Catholic Church puts her up on a pedestal, but actually puts her up next to Jesus. And says that, number one, she was holy, and she never sinned, and she was so good that she never died, but was ascended up into heaven like Jesus, and that she is the one we're to pray to so that she can give it to Jesus, and then Jesus can be nice to us. That's not how it is. Because when Mary first heard, but from the angel, that she was to bear the Christ child, she said, I rejoice in God my Savior. Amen. Mary was a sinner who needed a Savior. She needed the very Son that God was going to bless her to give to this world. Amen. Amen. So if Mary needed a Savior, who are you? Amen? Let me tell you what this Savior is all about. The Savior comes from the Word to the world. John chapter 4 verse 40, When the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own Word. You see, they heard about Jesus... But when they were with Jesus, that's when they believed Jesus because they heard it coming from his own mouth. Let me tell you something. There's our witness to a lost world and then there's the witness of God's word to this lost world. Which do you think is going to save people? And he said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Somebody say amen. Acts chapter 13, verse 23, Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. You see, if you're listening to me and you don't think you need a Savior, then I just challenge you to open a Bible up one day. That's all I ask you to do is open a Bible up anywhere. And I think within a matter of a few minutes, God will somehow, someway convince you you're not as good as you think you are and you're on your way to hell and Jesus came to stop you from going to hell. 
you need a savior. He's the savior of his body. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. Therefore as the church is subject unto Christ. So let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave. Here you go husbands. You see even Jesus gives gifts to his wife. Woo! And gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. Here it is, by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. First of all, where's all my wicked, undeserving sinners? Raise your hand. You're the ones that Christ comes to wash clean and make you holy by the water of his word. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Is A Savior is for those who need saving. Acts chapter 5, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Let me ask you, do you have sin in your heart today? So I'm not preaching anything new. I'm not preaching some new thing nobody's ever heard of before. I'm preaching old time kind of preaching, like preachers used to do a long time ago. And I'm going to ask you, do you have sins in your heart? Do you have things in your life that have not been forgiven of you by God himself? And if you do, you're on a road to hell, my friend. And Jesus Christ came to this earth born of a virgin, holy and clean and pure, so that he who has never done anything wrong could die and pay the penalty for you who did everything wrong. I'm going to ask you this morning, do you have, okay, you're getting clean socks for Christmas. You're getting new underwear for Christmas. You're getting aftershave. I'm just telling you what, you, what your wife got you, okay? You're getting a new tie. But if you don't have a Savior, and you don't have forgiveness, you have nothing. And let me tell you something. All the stuff, that you've accumulated and are accumulating in this life, they're going to burn up one day. And at the end of your life, all you'll have is forgiveness of every sin you've committed. If you offer me the world, I'll turn it down if I can have my sins forgiven. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What have you done that's so bad? What have you done that's so terrible that you think you can't be saved? You think you can't be forgiven? Let me introduce you a church full of very bad people. Bad, wicked people. Whom God has had mercy on and forgiven them of all of their transgressions and their sins. Yeah, you hear God's people say amen? amen. But you got to believe. You got to believe. You can't buy it. You can't go to church for four straight years and get a little piece of paper that says you're a member, therefore you're going to heaven. It doesn't work that way. You know there's members of churches that don't even believe the Bible? What does that say to you? Membership does not save you. Doing good deeds does not save you. Believing in Christ does. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 
For 2 Timothy chapter 1, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. This thing wasn't just God said, well, you know, they're all sinners. I think we need, somebody needs to die for their sins. Who can we do this? God thought of this before the world began. Somebody say amen. amen. By the way, he's a, that, being, that says he's a faithful savior. While you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Raise your hand, Bethel people, if you promise that you would never fail God again, and yet you did. Jesus never fails us. This is why the whole world doesn't celebrate your birthday. By the way, he's the only one. Don't fall for the liberal lie that says Buddha and Muhammad and everybody, all these other religions can save you. They're all roads to God. That's a lie. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 45, 21, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together, who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time, have not I the Lord. There is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside Him. Let me tell you about a young man. How old is he? 11? Did you say 11? Your nephew? Huh? 14 years old. And he is trapped in a North Africa nation. And he has all the papers. He's an American citizen. has all the papers that he needs to come back to America. And he tried to leave and they caught him because they hate the fact that he believes in Jesus Christ. Did I tell it right? That's going on right now. Right now. While we're here enjoying Christmas presents, watching it snow, going to eat a bunch of food and all this stuff, there's a young man that God's people need to pray for because the people in that nation hate the name of Jesus Christ. He said, don't give me this nonsense. Well, there's salvation in all the religions. Really? Well, what about the religion that wants to kill everybody in our religion? There's no salvation in that. There's only death and hate. So what's his first name? We'll call him Jesse. You pray for Jesse, 14 years old, trapped, and only God can set him free. So this morning, we're going to pray for this young man. And you're going to tell God, thank you, that God allowed you to be free do you need a savior you need a savior and there's only one and it's not you you know what the bible says is there any is there any place where it said a man saved himself it's not possible that you can save yourself someone has to save you like a fireman rushing in the house or a police officer standing between you and harm's way or the rescuers pulling you out of the wrecked car rescuing you because you could not rescue yourself or the governor signing a piece of paper stating that you've paid for your crimes and I'm going to release you. You can't release yourself from jail. That has to be done for you. And there's only one that can do it for you. And his name is Jesus. And we sit all morning singing songs in his honor and praising him and glorifying him. And we join a company of angels who glorify God together with mankind in saying, this is the one and only Son of God born to save us from our sins. Do you need a Savior? I want you to bow your heads. I want you to think about Jesse, 14-year-old boy who's not getting gifts for Christmas. He's not going to eat ham and cookies. He doesn't get to see it snow. Can't be with family. 
this evil people have a 14-year-old in jail because he believes in Jesus. That's his crime. How blessed you are. And yet, he's free in that with Jesus in his heart. It doesn't matter what they do to him. Even if they kill him, he'll be free in eternity with Jesus in heaven. Will you? See, there's a worse bondage, and I preached on this last Sunday, there's a worse bondage than even being in prison in a third world nation. It's the bondage of your own sins. And you're going to have to pay the price for those sins. Unless you'll believe that one man already has paid the price for your sin. One man already has. Will you accept it? Will you believe? I'm going to give you a moment. And I want you to pray. I want you to pray for Jesse. That God will reach down and release him. And God will be glorified. And then most sinners over there in that country would see the power of Almighty God and find out they're worshiping the wrong one. But I also want you to consider whether or not you're ready to meet your Savior. Is today the day? I'm not a hard salesman. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I'm not trying to. I don't think getting saved should be embarrassing. Right where you are, watching online, sitting here listening to me, you can tell God that you're ready to meet the Savior today. And if you do, let me know about it. Father, I come before you and I offer you these people. I lay them at the foot of the cross. It is yours to save them. It is theirs to receive it or reject it. But I lay them at your feet. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for Jesus. I don't think, Father, that I could spend a lifetime saying enough about what Jesus has done for me. And so, Lord, while I live, While I breathe, help me to spend what time I have sharing with others the real Jesus and the gospel. God, if you can save me, you can save anybody if they'll just believe. So, Father, I pray that somebody hear my voice, and Lord, they could be 5,000 miles away in Kenya. They could be in New York. They could be in Canada and the Philippines. They can be anywhere. And I just pray, God, that one, just one, would come before you today and say, Father, I'm ready to receive my Savior Jesus. Father, I pray, dear God, for Jesse. Lord, I don't know him. I hope to meet him in heaven one day because I want to tell him what a blessing he is to me and what a hero he is to me for suffering the greatest form of persecution. I pray, Father, that you would set him free. And, Father, let his life be a testimony to those heathens who hate you that they're serving the wrong God and that they themselves would be saved by it. And Father, we pray, dear God, that you bless him, bless his family, make him free. 
Bless this company of people today that have come. And I pray, dear God, that they'll all come to realize they need a Savior. Thank you, Lord, for dealing with us. Thank you, Lord, for visiting with us. Thank you, Lord, for putting a joyous song in our heart. Help us, dear God, to remember you always and to keep you first. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Are you glad you came to the Lord's house this morning? Amen.